afternoon, everybody, um, and thanks ever so much for joining us today. Um, welcome to this UK Energy Research Centre webinar on mapping participation for democratic innovations, which is going to be all about a new briefing report launched today that describes an experiment in evaluating a citizens panel on home energy decarbonisation. My name is Tom Hargreaves and I'm a co-investigator on the UK uh, Energy Research Centre Public Engagement Observatory. For anyone here who hasn't heard of the observatory before, um, the, UK, uh, the UK Public Engagement Observatory is developing novel approaches to mapping the many different ways that publics engage with both energy and climate change. Um, one of our previous webinars reported on some of this mapping work and for anybody that's interested, please do take a look at our website and our other briefing reports that describe the different mappings that we've conducted and the methods that we're using. But one of the things that today's session is going to focus on is, as part of the observatory, we're conducting a series of different collaborative experiments with a range of different partners in which we're exploring how these new approaches to mapping public engagement, the new kinds of insights and evidence that they produce, how does that actually make a difference in practice to decision making, innovations and new forms of participation around energy and climate change? And that's exactly what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I said, my name's uh, Tom Hargreaves, and I'm a co-investigator on the uh, observatory. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Fidias Stephanides, who's the lead researcher here at the University of East Anglia on the Public Engagement Observatory. Fidias is going to talk about the new briefing report out today on mapping participation for democratic innovation. And then we're going to hand over to four excellent panellists who are really happy to have been able to join us today. That's Dr. Jacob Ainscoff from the Climate Citizens Project, Simon Rayner from the Committee on Climate Change, Mara Livermore from Shared Future Community Interest Company, and Professor Jason Silvers from the, the UK uh, Public Engagement Observatory. I'll introduce each of those speakers as we come to them, but all of them have been involved in this experiment, experiment in different ways, so we'll be able to shed really valuable insights on the report that we're introducing and launching today. Uh, we will then hopefully have time for some questions and a bit of a panel discussion before we wrap up at three o'clock. Um, so without further ado, I think that's me and I shall hand over now to uh, Dr. Fidias Stefanidis from the Observatory to talk you through and introduce the report. Fidias, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks everyone for being here today. So basically during this first part of today's webinar, we'll present some key insights and findings from this experiment and for further information and for details, please do scan the QR code on your screens or follow the link that will shortly be posted uh, in the webinar chat itself. This new collective experiment makes two important contributions uh, to existing work on public engagement and participatory democracy in more general terms. It is one of the first attempts to explore how emerging approaches to mapping public engagement developed by the observatory might shape democratic innovations in practice. And secondly, but equally importantly, it explores radically new ways of considering the quality of public participation and of deliberation processes. But first, a bit of context on the Citizens Panel itself. The Citizens Panel was a collaboration between Lancaster University Climate Citizens Project, the Climate Change Committee, and shared future. The 24 citizen panelists involved in the process were invited to explore what needs to happen to bring home energy use in line with the need to tackle climate change. And they spent seven online and in-person sessions discussing around these issues. The process followed a principle of co-design in which technical experts and citizens alike worked collaboratively to develop actionable solutions which integrate different forms of knowledge. After the citizens panel had been established and shortly before the process commenced, uh, the Climate Citizens Project team invited the UK Observatory to contribute to evaluating the process. But rather than simply undertake a standard deliberative evaluation, we saw this as an opportunity to openly explore what difference the observatory's approaches, methods, and understandings might make to the citizens panel. We specifically proposed a collective experiment that had three interrelated parts, and you're gonna see a diagram on that shortly. First of all, we brought the comparative case analysis methods of the observatory 
and the emerging mappings of diverse forms of public engagement into the process to inform the design, practice, and evaluation of the citizens' panel. We also went beyond standard deliberative process evaluation criteria to involve additional reflexive criteria, which were operationalized by drawing on evidence from participant observation during the course of the citizens' panel itself and from interviews with participants and orchestrators alike. We also applied the latest thinking and associated criteria on reflexive participation practice in a collaborative, reflective process to prompt reflection, formative feedback on, and adjustments to the citizens panel and the reporting on it on an ongoing basis and in the real time. The first main step in developing this evaluation experiment involved reconsidering the qualities of participation uh, developing, in other words, a novel evaluation framework. Standard evaluation frameworks often emphasize evaluation criteria, including being representative and inclusive, fair, informed, transparent, and learning oriented. These criteria are, of course, really important, but in this experiment, we also incorporated new ways of thinking about the qualities of participation emerging in science and technology studies and from work on the remaking participation that underpins the, the observatory's approach. This suggests that additional things should be taken into consideration, including being responsive and reflexive to exclusions in problem framings, participants, and the process of participation, being open to diverse forms of participation on the issue and how they interrelate in wider systems, and being responsible about the ethical issues, the future implications, and the effects of participation. Following co-production of this evaluation framework with the panel orchestrators, we conducted a focus mini-mapping to help contextualize this specific deliberative process, employing basically the public engagement observatory comparative case analysis method. Through our focus mini-mapping, the observatory team identified relevant and diverse cases of public engagement around home energy use and decarbonization. And the orchestrator team was subsequently invited to draw on these insights to identify any overlooked viewpoints, to consider process design choices, and to communicate the findings of the panel in a way that acknowledged diverse issue frameworks and ecologies of participation. According to this mapping, whilst eight additional deliberative processes were orchestrated in the past around similar topics, deliberations such as this specific citizens panel on home energy decarbonization are but one form of engagement in a broader landscape of at least 89 relevant public engagements occurring in the UK between 2015 and 2022. Our mapping, across this wider system of public engagement with home energy decarbonization shows that it is a highly varied and diverse in terms of who participates and what they participate in as well. What is particularly striking when visualizing the mapping data in this figure is the way it broadens that the young institution-led public involvement to more citizen-led and grassroots form of engagement and action and also how it points to additional and alternative public views and solutions to the challenges of home energy decarbonization that are coming forward from across society. Specifically, our mapping also shows that broadening out to wider diversity of public engagements can reveal additional public perspectives, visions, and concerns that may be missed or marginalized by narrowly framed institution-led instances of participation. Cases in the comparative case mapping span across at least 14 different primary foci of engagement. Dark blue bars in this chart here indicate key issue framings that were common between past engagements and this specific citizens panel. Light blue bars in this chart, on the other hand, represent issue framings such as energy poverty and energy justice identified in alternative engagements that were not the core foci of this specific 
citizens panel. What cases located in the top left part of the mapping space presented earlier on were principally, were principally framed in terms of climate change, decarbonization, net zero, or sustainable energy technologies, alternative cases situated more towards the right part of the mapping space placed more emphasis, emphasis on additional public concerns over energy poverty, affordability, equity, justice, comfort, and well being, amongst others. Some of these additional cases are also more often associated with alternative visions of energy transitions, including broader concerns around sustainable living and around the need to challenge current forms of living through the development of, for instance, of low carbon acre homes, through the development of community energy schemes, and also through radical sociocultural change through alternative models of growth and social progress. But how exactly did the citizens panel perform when evaluated against our evaluation criteria and against our mappings? Well, in a nutshell, through this evaluation experiment, we find that the citizens panel process performed quite well when judged against standard deliberative criteria. Representativeness and inclusivity were priorities and panelists appreciated how the panel was a melting pot of people with different backgrounds and attitudes, in spite of the intentional exclusion of specific types of publics. The citizens panel also allowed fair deliberation in spite of some challenges in equalizing relations between citizens and experts. Whilst time was a precious resource, of course, the panel overall provided panelists with generally good access to resources. And we also found evidence of enhanced learning uh, by everyone involved in the process, participants and stakeholder orchestrators alike. And finally, the overall aim and focus of the process was made open and transparent to participants and discussions were quite focused and on track to produce a very clear set of recommendations, albeit the fact that there was some confusion as to how these recommendations could actually influence practice on the ground and policy making on the ground. However, the more reflexive qualities of participation proved to be far more challenging. The team running the citizens panel did really well to respond to reflexive questions of the, and the observatory mapping in new ways. But some aspects of the process remain close to these possibilities to a certain extent at least. A key set of exclusions occurred through how the process was tightly framed in technical and policy oriented terms. The orchestrators did this deliberately to produce usable evidence for policymakers. This instrumental framing was reinforced by the co-design framing, where citizens, part where citizen participants were basically asked not to deviate from the core focus and often found themselves looking for the proposals to be validated in a sense by the climate change committee team and by the citizens, climate citizens team as well. Nonetheless, this deliberate focus on bringing the energy use of non-energy poor householders in line with the need to tackle climate change ultimately excluded both energy poor householders and tenants, as well as additional public concerns and competing or alternative perspectives of climate and energy futures. Our observatory mapping introduced earlier on showed that such issues and alternative courses of action are raised in other forms of public engagement. Through our collaborative process, the citizens panel orchestrators came to openly reflect on these exclusions in the process and in the reporting on the panel, and to consider how this particular citizens panel is situated within a broader landscape of public engagement. However, we suggest that there were opportunities to go further in systemically reflecting on the underlying purposes and assumptions, and as well as in anticipating the longer term social implications of the citizens panel. For example, 
and how the deliberative formats of participation link to policy for grants, certain forms of citizen participation and democratic arrangements over others. How the co-design format or the participants involved may have played a role in closing down the possible futures that were expressed. And how the imagined future in the resulting recommendations emphasizes techno-economic solutions as part of the centrally organized transition that intentionally overlooks certain additional actors and alternative futures. Now, overall, the collective experiment, and in spite of some flaws, has demonstrated that emerging approaches to mapping public participation and engagement can play important roles in shaping, enhancing, and situating democratic innovations. The observatory mapping specifically prompted the citizens panel orchestrator to openly reflect on the partialities and exclusions of this particular process and how, as we've said before, it is situated within this wider ecology of participation. This led to a large number of novel responses. For instance, in changing the range and nature of expert commentators that were included in the citizens panel by publicizing and reporting on the panel in a way that openly situates its outcomes and exclusions in the relation to this wider landscape of engagements. And without claiming that the document presenting the outcomes of this panel represents the view of the UK public in general, and whilst reflecting on the implications of the Kurizan participation format in a very transparent manner. Also, by reflecting on how mapping public engagement can play important additional roles in shaping democratic innovations in other ways in the future and when conducted earlier on in such processes. For instance, in terms of providing useful additional inputs to the framing, design, and formation provision, expert representation, and participant recruitment, amongst others. Last, but definitely not least, orchestrator reflections indicated that the value of the mapping participation approach can extend far beyond process design to provide more substantive inputs into science and policy decision-making. It is quite often assumed that participatory processes gain, gain power through closing down around definitive representations of the public and in providing consensual recommendations for policy. Yet, in this last quote on this slide, we see acknowledgement that opening up to considering diverse forms of participation and uncertainties about publics in the citizens panel did not lessen the strengths of its findings for policy, and in many ways could have made them more robust, in fact. So, overall, this collective experiment presented today has tested novel approaches to democratic innovations. The experiment, mappings, novel evaluation criteria show how they can radically benefit public deliberation and participatory practice. It is the first time that such reflexive criteria and emerging approaches to mapping public engagement have been applied and evaluated the qualities of participation and in shaping democratic innovations. On both fronts, the experiment has demonstrated how these approaches can be successfully applied in practice. It's not just abstract theory. Hence, drawing our experience from this experiment, would like to conclude with four key recommendations for future participatory practice. First of all, we believe that formative and reflexive modes of evaluation should be taken forward in future practice and occur early on before key aspects of participatory practices have been established. Practitioners also need to open up to such more reflexive questions and criteria that consider the downsides, the exclusions, and the long-term effects of participation. Specifically, our reflexive criteria and our mapping methods can, we believe can play important roles in shaping, enhancing, and in situating future democratic innovations as well. 
And finally, we strongly believe that those orchestrating and publicizing public engagements need to be quite open about the exclusions during the process and when claiming representations of the public in process reporting. So that's all from me. Back to you, Tom, and to the rest of panelists for any comments. Brilliant. Thank you uh, ever so much, uh, Fidius, for introducing the, the, the briefing report. And don't forget, everybody, you can download the report. Please do so. Um, we'll perhaps try and share a, a link in the chat as well. And, and Fidius has already shared various QR codes. Um, we're, we're, we're doing well on time. So we're now. I'm now delighted to be able to hand over to um, our different panellists. Um, all of whom have been have been involved in the uh, citizens panel and in the collaboration experiment in different kinds of ways. So they've all got kind of really interesting perspectives and insights to share on how they experience this whole process. Um, so first of all, we're going to hear from Dr. Jacob Ainscoff from uh, the Climate Citizens Project. Jacob is a senior research associate at Lancaster University, where he's leading research on embedding deliberation in the policy process as part of the Climate Citizens Project. Uh, which is his part of a much bigger team there, led by Professor Rebecca Willis. Um, and it was part of that project, it was actually as part of that project that this citizens panel uh, was designed, that's the focus of our collaboration experiment. So, uh, Jacob, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, as Thomas said, I, I work at Lancaster University as part of the Climate Citizens Project. Um, and this whole citizens panel was was um, something that came about from from our project at Lancaster. Um, and what we really wanted to do is look at can you take a, a, a relatively kind of technical policy area like um, home energy home, home energy decarbonisation um, and bring together members of the public with kind of the experts and in inverted commas at the climate change committee to to co-design a set of policy solutions. Um, and for us, it was it was. Um, incredibly successful project you know what the what the participants came up with at the end of it we thought was robust was well well rounded and um, um i'll leave to simon to sort of talk about how those those results were carried forward um but for anyone sort of running a project like this or running a a process like this i guess we were the evaluees being evaluated by by Thedius and his team at, at ukirk um and you're all forever obviously kind of negotiating a series of tensions you know you have only so much time to work with you do have to pick a particular framing who's involved who isn't involved um and there's a real art i guess to trying to negotiate those questions and negotiate those tensions um particularly maybe with more deliberative methods in the way that we were using them to gather information i think deliberative methods in in being open and in in kind of giving giving people more information and more time they feel quite empowering, and yet we were still in a situation where this was about kind of gathering information to feed into a policy process. So we also had to sort of manage that tension um, in terms of what um, the participants thought they were doing there and making sure we were setting those expectations. Um, and so in doing that, in making those decisions, as, as the report already says, you know, you do you do have to come down on the line, you do have to make those choices, and, and, and maybe sometimes you do draw the boundary and, and start excluding things. And I don't think that's necessarily a problem. You know, it's not that every space should be an activist space. It's not that every space should have a totally open horizon. There are sometimes very kind of practical reasons why you want, might want to set those limits in a certain place. But I think what's really important is making those decisions with your eyes fully open. So we we had the observatory team on board, but also um, uh, staff from the CCC, um, specialists from Shared Futures, all sort of as part of an ecosystem helping us try and negotiate and make some of those decisions um, and certainly having the observatory team on board sort of pushed us I think to reflect further than we otherwise would have done about some of those choices we were making um, and in some cases push us in different directions and, and I think you'll see from the report suggestions that we potentially could have could have done more um, but I think you know having that team there was a really vital, vital part of making sure we could we could make those choices in an informed way um, so just finally I think ahead of this webinar sort of reflecting back on on the process i think something that struck me is just how much of a skill that is to be able to sort of negotiate those tensions and make those choices um and you know we were supported very closely in doing it but i think looking back one of the things that really strikes me is as we do look to embed these types of processes and more participatory processes in climate and, and energy policy making there kind of probably isn't a replacement for in-house expertise. You know, organisations like Shared Future and like Involve 
can provide an awful lot, but I don't think there is really a replacement for having people within an organization who've had these experiences and sort of have experience trying to make these decisions. So one of the really great take-homes or one of the really great results of this process actually is to see sort of how the, the Climate Change Committee have carried forward and started to try and build some of that, that in-house expertise, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Simon to talk about that. But yeah, I guess that's one of the take-homes for me is it's, it is challenging. I don't think there is any replacement for sort of having people who've kind of been through these processes and um, uh, yeah, have that experience. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, um, Jacob. And actually, your, your final kind of reflection there is a perfect uh, link into our next speaker. Um, next, we are indeed going to hear from Simon Rayner, who is a policy analyst in the Committee on Climate Change and has been working there on using deliberative policy design methods to support better climate policy making. Um, and with re in, in relation to today's um, focus, Simon was involved in designing, designing the systems panel and contributed to it as one of the expert speakers, but also as a participant in some of the co-design elements of the pro of, of the of, of the process. So, uh, Simon, delighted to hear your uh, reflections on that. Over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Tom. Um, so, um, as, as you're probably aware, um, our role is to um, advise government on how to uh, mitigate and adapt to, to climate change and uh, monitor the government's prog progress in doing so. Um, and we advise on emissions targets and uh, policies required to deliver them. Um, and uh, reflecting on the advice we develop and, and engaging a wide range of people in developing that advice is is a kind of is an ongoing challenge. Uh, and there are you know there are some changes in uh, in policy such as changing our power system, which have fairly limited impacts on people's everyday lives. Um, but but increasingly the actions that are still needed, such as how we heat our homes, uh, directly affect people um, and involve you know uh, individual members of the public uh, making decisions. So understanding um, how people view policy proposals uh, and what their preferences are, uh, and getting their input into policy design are, are really important to getting those decisions right. Um, and importantly, if we're able to uh, to to, to do these things, it also provides us with evidence to shape our recommendations to government. Uh, so the owner owner occupied homes, which was the the, the the kind of policy segment that we that we chose to focus on, is uh, sixty percent of emissions from uh, from residential buildings. Um, but there's actually very little policy uh, in place, and it's a it's a it's a difficult area um, to to come up with policy. So that was you know. Why we thought it would particularly benefit from this uh, approach of using a, a deliberative panel, um, and uh, we found it was um, really valuable to be involved in in that process um, uh, in in a, a kind of number of levels. Um, so the outputs themselves were were really useful. Um, engaging with participants and particularly, you know, engaging. We, we spend a lot of time. Uh, talking to stakeholders who are kind of uh, very closely involved in these policy areas, but um, yeah, engaging with people who 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 you know don't have um, the same level of technical technical knowledge, but are going to be uh, impacted by policies is just immensely helpful and and also quite you know quite invigorating as well. Being able to um, get get out of the office, get out uh, you know get away from uh, building models to actually. You know, talking to people, um, and it was also really useful uh, seeing and shaping the process, uh, working with the facilitators to um, to kind of guide the process as it went along, and try and ensure that what we were actually aiming um, to get out get out of it was uh, delivered. Um, ultimately, we presented the findings to the government in uh, a letter to Minister in Bayes, which outlined the conclusions. And also, remember, we were able to emphasise that uh, with the right information, there can be public support for the the kind of policies that are required. Um, I just, uh, I suppose, reflecting on on the the report today, um, I suppose it um, it adds to a, a kind of a continuum of reflection in our own work, um, and it's really important that we incorporate this into what we do. So, you know, we spend a lot of time building models and doing quantitative analysis, uh, but that requires then kind of reflecting on the policies that are required um, and how we model and analyze them. 
we make policy recommendations um, and it requires reflecting on their impacts on people uh, and ensuring we engage with people. So, um, and what this work by UCAP does is, you know, actually reflects on how that engagement is done uh, and how this process sits uh, in a wider context of public engagement and action. Uh, and since uh, since the citizens panel, which was which is now over a year ago, we've actually created a new team within the CCC, which is focused on people and business. So it's looking at cost cutting issues such as costs and distributional impacts and the role of public engagement. Uh, and we're developing plans for more use of deliberative processes and other forms of engagement to support our work. Uh, that's look that includes looking at use of a citizens panel to. Um, to try and articulate a kind of um, attractive vision of net zero from, from a household perspective and looking at measures such as diet, flying, modal shift, um, transition to electric vehicles, as well as uh, home heating and energy efficiency. Uh, uh, yeah, and I, I think as we move forward with this, it's important that we continue to reflect on how to engage and we learn from previous experience. Uh, and so, yeah, this, this report and the work of the Public Engagement Observatory are a really valuable part of that. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, uh, Simon, for your insights. Um, I was delighted to see also, as Simon was speaking, that our first questions come into the question and answer box. So please don't forget to add your own question to the panellists or to panellists or the observatory team, and we should have time to take them towards the end of today's session. Uh, next and third, we're going to hand over to uh, Mara Livermore. Uh, Mara is an associate at Shared Future, an experienced facilitator of different deliberative approaches. She was involved in actually facilitating the citizens panel that's at the heart of today's session. So Mara, delighted to have you here. We're looking forward to hearing your pers perspectives. Yes, thank you. Delighted to be here as well. It is always, it's very interesting for me to hear about how the process has been seen and how it's gone on from a number of different angles. So. Uh, my background is actually in ops and strategy and facilitation and working a lot with uh, creative tech and impact entrepreneurs. And I've been working alongside Shared Future since about 2020 on a number of different processes. And uh, some of the common denominators are always this kind of adaptive process. And so how we work and how we facilitate is really rooted on being quite responsive and, and building in quite a lot of space for reflection, being able to understand uh, what's going on with individuals and across the process so that we can then pick commentators for sessions as we go along, things like that. Um, being part of this one in particular was really, really interesting because there were a lot more eyes on. And so usually our focus and especially me as a facilitator in session my job is uh, managing a lot of different things so for example when you're if you run an event and you invite people who are interested in climate you get a certain demographic which is generally a lot more aligned in a number of different ways and has a similar and more similar and common factors which you can bring people together around however these processes are designed from the bottom up to bring in very diverse people with differing opinions and differing experiences so you don't ho have those kind of all aligning factors to bring people behind but what i've noticed process after process which is one of the reasons why i love this work is that it completely proves wrong anyone who says that regular people don't care and regular people don't want to get involved and regular people don't want to collaborate or work with strangers because we see people going out of their comfort zone, making new friends, and by the end of the process, usually going on to continue to advocate for some of the things that they've heard and learned about in the process, uh, even going on to take jobs in the sector and this kind of thing. So it is a really uh, inspiring and beautiful thing to see and be a part of. This one was in Birmingham as well, which is where I'm from originally. So it was also nice to be uh, doing this kind of work in my hometown for the first time after uh, otherwise working across the country. And I think I'll say about the reflective uh, process and the collaboration in particular for me opened up a lot of extra information and data on my facilitation and exactly how that worked and also ideas for how we can move forward or different ways that other parts um, 
other pieces of tech, for example, might be able to help us adapt and improve the way we run processes in the future. I'll say the shared future team as a whole have been really, really engaged in making sure that, like others have commented on, that everyone is really rooted in answering this question, even if it doesn't speak to the whole of the wider issue that other people might have interests in. And also in designing processes that are equitable, we try as much as possible to split up any thinking and talking time with other exercises designed with um, equitable and somatic methodologies in mind so that this isn't just an exercise of benefiting those or 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 what's the word uh allowing allowing someone to take the podium just because they're the most articulate and the quickest thinker and they can get their thoughts out quicker we use a lot of different varieties of of tools and practices experiments and games to make sure that many different forms of communication, many different skills, and everyone in the room is having their voice heard as equally as possible. Brilliant, thank you ever so much, uh, Mara, for your insights. Um, and I please see some more questions coming in. Please do keep these coming in and they'll, we'll, we'll keep the question and answer box open and try and get to these, as many of these as we can in the final uh, ses ses session of uh, today. Um, fourth and finally, we're going to hear from Professor Jason Chilvers, who's the principal investigator of the UK Public Engagement Observatory. Jason, over to you. Thanks so much, Tom, and to Jake, Simon and Mara for those excellent reflections. Um, uh, a hard act to follow, but I'll try my best. Um, I think that uh, the first thing I'd just like to say is just a massive thank you to all of the partners involved in undertaking the Citizen Panel on home energy decarbonisation. Um, the Climate Citizens team and all the other partners involved, I think should be commended very highly for being so open and responsive to, to the new perspectives we tried to bring into this experiment. And um, as we've seen today, this has brought forward new ways of doing and lessons for future practice. So it's been a really productive um, collaboration. I think that uh, Jake has put this very well uh, in sort of, and, and the other panelists as well, in, in sort of saying that this is a real challenge in, in negotiating various tensions. Um, uh, I think that we, we kind of made this process for everyone involved kind of trebly challenging in addition to how challenging these processes already are. So as Phineas has mentioned, as opposed to the kind of dominant practice of, of running an independent evaluation where we uh, in the observatory team might have been quite distant. We might have asked a few questions along the way and we might have then published our insights so-called after the event. We attempted this much more collaborative, formative and ongoing exchange and evaluation here. Um, this is really challenging having these questions continually posed, uh, but we did find, I think, together that it did enhance things. So a key suggestion, I think, coming from this work is that um, this more collaborative, formative uh, uh, practice should go forward in, in, in future uh, evaluative work on, on participation. The second thing we did, as we've heard, is we asked different questions that, and, and brought in different criteria that, that we'd normally um, uh, tend to use in, in, in evaluating deliberative process or deli deliberative mini publics. Um, to move on to other uh, criteria that might consider the downsides, the exclusions, the effects of participation as well. So again, this is challenging to have these questions about exclusions, about how you're framing the process, being asked to you as you're trying to deal with all of the other things that you're trying to manage when um, putting on one of these uh, citizens panels or trying to facilitate it and mediate it. Um, but this is what the, the team involved did and the climate citizen team and the other partners in responding to these questions, not only just reflecting on it, but taking action in questioning around the framing, as we've heard in selecting other expert uh, witnesses and so on. So, you know, one thing we can say from this is that the questions that we ask in evaluation of participation, including deliberative processes, need to be opened up to these more reflexive questions and criteria moving forward. And third, as we've heard, we've we brought in our work from the observatory on mapping diverse forms of public engagement 
around uh, the issues under discussion here. And, you know, the team did an amazing job here. This led to novel responses. In particular, if you look at the report produced by Jake and Becky and colleagues on the Climate Citizens Project from this, this citizens panel, it is very reflective and it does something different to how you would normally see um, a citizens panel publicised and reported on. It openly situates the recommendations of the findings of this panel in that wider landscape of public engagement that, that we, we sort of brought forward from, from our mappings. So a key, key take home here is that those orchestrating and reporting on public engagements uh, need to be, you know, kind of avoid making these complete representations of the public when reporting on these sorts of processes. We often hear the UK public think this about net zero or whatever else it is. Um, the UK public, maybe we should um, qualify and situate such claims a lot more when presenting the findings of, 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 of opinion surveys, deliberative processes and other forms of public elicitation. Um, and this is what happened in this experiment. So I think that the, 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 the sort of reports that have come forward here uh, gives some guidance on, on, on how this can be done in the future. Um, as Phineas has said, you know, we found that opening up all of these things that have been discussed in, 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 in the webinar so far didn't necessarily uh, reduce the strength or credibility of the citizen panel and, and in many ways um, could have made it more robust. And finally, um, I'd just like to, uh, you know, follow on from what Jake alluded to is that we could have done so much more uh, with this experiment and there's always more that we could do. And what was really nice is at the end of the experiment, we all got together as partners and reflected on, on, on the process, on the citizens panel, on the, the, the work that we brought in from the observatory side. And we just reflected on how, say, the, the sort of mappings that we're doing and the work we're doing on the observatory might um, inform future practice. And people came up with really creative ideas about it could, how it could help the design of these things, information provision, expert representation, but also maybe participant recruitment. And it can help us understand that participants within deliberative processes are already engaged in multiple ways, in other ways, before, during and after the event. And I think one final reflection is that we came into this pretty, pretty late in the day before the citizens panel started. So as an observatory team, we came in before the panel started, but quite late in the process design phase of this. And maybe if um, we'd collaborated even earlier, then, then some of these uh, possibilities that we've reflected on, uh, on, on as a collective um, could, have, could have been taken on. And just to say in the observatory, we've been working with an approach called distributed deliberative mapping, which is where we use our mappings to inform, say, deliberative process design, where from the mapping that, that Phidias showed earlier, there's, there's lots of different forms of engagement. So we would do the citizens panel process but also um, go to some of those already existing engagements and take the, 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 you know, to ask those already existing engagements to engage in um, the same sort of, asking the same sort of questions, in this case about home energy decarbonisation. We've got a number of these collaborative experiments that we're doing um, in the UK Public Engagement Observatory, linking up with policymakers, trying to feed our our mappings into new forms of innovation as well, in, uh, in addition to new forms of participation. And we look forward to sharing these in, insights with you in due course. If these other experiments are as successful as this one, we're going to be extremely pleased. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jason. And um, we've got a number of uh, great questions coming in uh, now. So please do keep sending your questions in. Um, but I'll, I'll start with the first question that came in from Nick Pidgeon of Cardiff University. And Nick asks, and I think this is more to the observatory team, um, asks what were the indicators in the data or the record of the process that led, um, led us to the conclusions being drawn here? Can we give a simple example? For example, participants commenting on narrow framings or raising a frame of their own. So how did the observatory team really draw the conclusions that are at the heart of this report? Perhaps I could ask all panelists just to turn their cameras on as well. That might be uh, nice so we can see everyone. Thanks, everybody. So, Phineas, do you want to respond to this one? Yep, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, 
first let's start by clarifying that uh, collecting evidence from this panel involves doing kind of some interviews with participants and stakeholders themselves, but also participating in and observing uh, some of the sessions uh, themselves. So in terms of kind of concrete evidence, concrete evidence uh, in terms of the framing issues and kind of the narrow framing, I guess there's two types of evidence we're referring to here. First of all, uh, through the, by observing uh, the, the discussions themselves, we often, uh, we often find a striking discrepancy, let's say, between what people would be discussing during breaks in between sessions and then what they would actually be discussing uh, during the formal sessions themselves. So uh, when observing uh, the sessions of the panel, I always got that feeling that in a sense, participants themselves were trying to censor, censor themselves to ensure that we're being focused and addressing a specific question whilst during breaks, they would also be addressing additional related issues. Um, the other thing also is that exactly because of this focus on home energy decarbonization, during the formal sessions as well, they did touch upon additional issues, but exactly because of this emphasis on focusing and answering that specific question, they always, the discussions always ended up kind of sidelined to a certain extent, these additional concerns in the interest of producing very focused recommendations that address this very specific uh, issue. Um, then also in terms of kind of the, the, the interviews we had with some of the participants themselves, uh, yeah, upon reflection in the relation, and when I say participants, I do refer to both the citizen participants, but also the orchestrators themselves, uh, through this reflexive process and through kind of very open and honest discussions with everyone involved, uh, citizens and orchestrators alike, uh, lots of people openly express this kind of idea that, yeah, we could have discussed about other issues as well, which are linked uh, to this issue of home energy decarbonization. But obviously, as Jake alluded to earlier on, it's about kind of, there's always this challenge of striking that balance between being focused as opposed to opening up to additional framings. So from our point of view, and I think I can speak on behalf of the observatory as a whole, it's not that we're claiming that any single process can include an attempt to all framings. It's more about being really transparent and open about the exclusions as well, and considering what the implications of those exclusions are in practice. Great, thank you, Fidius. I, mean, I wonder if any of the other panelists um, wanted to reflect on this, you know, for example, the idea about you know the, the way participants behaved in the actual official sessions and how that might have differed from what what they spoke about in the breaks. I mean, Mara as a facilitator, or, or Jacob as and Simon as kind of being parts of in the room during these processes. Do I, any of you have any reflections on those sorts of observations? <laughs> Who'd, Mara? Yeah. yeah, I can share a little bit, which is that we do notice that as well. Obviously, uh, we work to make sure that the sessions track with what the commissioning body is asking and therefore we do uh, spend quite a lot of uh, we do try and do that fine dance uh, but design things so that it is pointing people back towards the topic otherwise you'd be in a room with 30 very interesting people having a very interesting conversation for a really long time but we would not get to, it would take us uh, maybe a year or so to get to a set of recommendations the other thing that we do do though is kind of monitor and track and discuss these things. So we will be discussing sometimes operational things in the break, but we are also listening and watching for as these things kind of arise. And so if there is a way that, uh, I guess we kind of stay on it as a team. And if there is, if especially if something is tracking quite high and is consistently coming up, these are things that we do. We design the process so that we can address these things and look to create space. And one of the exercises that we always run is something like a problem tree. So we do a lot of exercises which are designed to help people think as broadly as possible and as deeply as possible about things that are underlying causes, which usually then have them pulling up things like poverty or like social injustices and things like that. Um, and then 
often as the process goes on and they go more um they people look more towards answering the question especially if they're aware they're in like a quite policy focused room and we um we call them commentators not uh, experts but sometimes we have processes designed to have a lot more community activists and uh, people who look a little bit more like them and have a little bit of experience more like them in the room uh so then they're kind of they are putting they are putting that hat on to speak of and so uh whilst i don't think it ever um completely disappears from their mind some of those some of those threads aren't as present in the conversations in the room and it's something yeah it's something that we look at quite closely Excellent. Thanks ever so much, um, Mara. Um, and so we have a, another question um, from Sheridan Few that has received the most up upvotes so far. Um, and Sheridan asks, I'm curious about the routes to impact in this work. Have outcomes fed into Committee on Climate Change recommendations for national government? Has there been engagement with regional government? Um, I think, Simon, you might be the most obvious person to take that one first as, as a, an analyst in the Committee on Climate Change. Is that OK? <laughs> I can try if I can unmute myself. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, as as I as I mentioned um, earlier, we um, uh, so Lancaster Uni wrote their report. We at the same time when it was published, um, we wrote a letter to uh, the Minister of State in what was then then Bayes, now uh, Desnes, um, and uh, and used it as an opportunity to say, you know, th this is a this is a difficult policy area, um, which um, you know I think the government um, finds quite politically challenging because you're, you're you're getting into a kind of situation where you're potentially telling people what to do with their with their houses, um, and uh, but we were able to say you know if you get a group of homeowners into a room and you and you give them the right information, um, actually they do support on the whole. Uh, putting policies in place to to address this issue, um, but there are uh, you know there were there were condition conditions to that you know that they they need well designed they wanted well designed policies um, they wanted uh, the government to uh, provide uh, leadership on the changes and kind of set out you know really clear kind of long term program for doing it um, they wanted kind of clear. Uh, reliable information on what it is they need to do to their individual homes um and uh yeah they wanted in you know in some instances for there to be um to be you know there to be funding in place um uh kind of government action to provide um you know energy advice services things like that so um so yeah i i think it was um it's it certainly it because we're aware this is a difficult policy area. Um, and so it certainly helped us to kind of have this um, uh, as, as kind of backing for some of the things, uh, some of the difficult things that we have to, to say to government. Fantastic. Thanks, Simon. Um, Hi, any, anybody else like to take that? What about the routes to impacts? Jason or, or Phoebus, perhaps? I have a little bit to say oh, yeah. Thank you. about that as well. Sorry to jump in. No, go for it. I'd like to go first, that's fine. Okay, um, which is that, I, I mean, I can't speak <clears throat> too much to the policy side, um, but also uh, slightly outside of looking at it as a policy issue and as a movement, some of the impact that happens. So we've seen, uh, as, as, as well as the recommendations, people write a state, they write a statement as well. Uh, we've seen those, picked up to be published completely separately. We didn't ask them to publish it, but people doing research into area uh, climate change on a wider scale have included things like that in their book. And we also see a room full of people who uh, previously weren't engaged necessarily with climate change that actively, like all getting behind things. We have individuals who go on to uh, join causes, to lobby, to, um, join uh local bus groups and things like that that um where which enough of that kind of thing is enough to move the needle in some areas as well and on a personal level i also really like to see people who aren't that confident necessarily um we have people who are busy they're carers they've got kids they've got other things going on um go on to leverage their experience in this space and build their confidence and go on to 
uh, do great things, which is really, really wonderful uh, to see. And at the end of the process, everyone usually votes to stay in touch, which is something that we don't as Shared Future monitor or manage. Uh, so we don't know the full impact of things that have happened, but some of the projects, some of the causes, I've seen people who couldn't really speak in front of the room at the beginning of a process, go on to speak to members of parliament by the end of one. So uh, those are some of the impacts and having those kinds of people go back to their communities and be educating people as well. Those households change. So there is a lot of on the ground impact as well that I'm particularly, that's what gets me out of bed to do this kind of thing. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Mara. Um, we've got about a minute and a half, so I'll very quickly try and get one final question in. Um, Andy Yule asks, um, or says, it's really interesting to see how the Citizens Panel fitted into a broader mapping of public engagements with home energy decarbonisation. Is there a sense that these make up a democratic system of many interconnected parts? And if so, how do they interact? Or do they exist more or less in isolation? I know, I'm sure Jason and Fidus will be, want to take this from um would jason Felix, would you like to say anything on that one yeah i'm happy to very quickly uh answer andy's uh, great question there um yeah i think a lot of most of our work on the observatory and what underpins it would suggest that these things never happen in isolation so this citizens panel deliberative processes are always interconnecting with other forms of participation in a wider ecology of public engagement and so we're very much trying to push forward this, this more systemic view of, of, of participation and public engagement. And I think in our work, we find that there are so many different interactions and interrelations um, between these different um, forms of participation. So within a deliberative process um, like this, we see that participants are already engaging with energy in the home and um, uh, questions of climate change and decarbonisation. They come to the process with those engagements already have happened. Um, through the process, they'll be engaged with uh, through the media or on social media and these kinds of things. And also, um, you know, they might, having been involved in this panel, go away and engage in not just thinking about the public issues here, but also actually doing things in terms of um, changing practices or behaviours. And so um, I think what, yeah, what we suggest through the observatory work is we not need to start exploring these interconnections and interrelations much more and feed that back into how we can think about improving and enhancing these democratic innovations. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, um, Jason. It is now three o'clock, so I'm afraid I am going to have to draw everything to a close. I'd just like to finish by saying thanks ever so much to all of our speakers today. We really valued your contributions. Thanks also to the audience for, for being here and for the great questions that you put in. I'm sorry to those of you who we weren't able to get to your questions. And just a final reminder that you can download the briefing report all about this experiment. Uh, the link is in the chat or look on the uh, UKIRC or the UKIRC Observatory websites. Um, thanks ever so much, everybody. We will be making a recording of this webinar available in a few days' time as well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.